shreds without sputtering gold, washed in the blood of the Lamb. Tis a glorious church without sputtering gold, washed in the blood of the Lamb. Oh, tis a glorious church without sputtering gold, washed in the blood of the of the Lord tonight. Aren't you glad you're part of that church? Yes. Amen. I'm so thankful to be back in the house of the Lord tonight. Just to be able to be in his presence and to worship him. For he alone is worthy of all our praise. Just join in with us tonight. Let's worship him.
my notes tonight, I couldn't help but just think about what I was going to share with you. And I'll, I'll say it, and then we're going to sing this song again. Part of my notes, Christians, we really sing good songs, but we really live a worldly life. Very true. We sing good Christian songs, but do we live that? Do we say, just one more drink, just in your presence? Do we really, do we really live that? So I want you to sing that song again, and I want to ask you, I want you to ask yourself this question. Am I doing what I'm singing? So let's sing that again. Lord, I come. Yes. Lord, I come. Take my life. Take my life. Offer it to you. Living sacrifice. have to be in the church setting. It can be in a prayer closet at home. It can be at the dining room table. It can be on the back 40 in the field, on the tractor. Give us a hunger to be in your presence. And God, there are needs in this room tonight, unspoken requests. You know all about them. And God, there are churches in our community that need a divine touch tonight sickness that has gone through those churches God that you would move and you would minister Father pray God we just hold them up Lord that you would be with them in a very special way tonight Lord there are needs spiritual needs we stand in the gap tonight Lord for that unsaved loved one for those individuals God that are struggling in their relationship with you God God, I plead the blood of Jesus tonight. Lord, that you would do a work in hearts and lives. You've not released me today. God, as I stand in the gap for those faces. God, that you would move and you would minister. Lord, you would restore them to you. Father, draw them by the Holy Spirit. And we thank you for this. In thy name we pray. Amen and amen, amen. You may be seated. Hallelujah. Let me do a little house cleaning or house preparation for next Sunday morning, if I may. We're going to move some more chairs in here in a little more different strategic place. And we're going to put some chairs for just one or two. Some of you tonight are sitting where there's three, there's four, and there's five. This morning... We had about 20 people try to come in and find places. So next Sunday, if you haven't moved forward, I want you to move forward and leave the back empty. Uh, and you say, well, I, that's not my spot. We don't have spots right now. There is no spot. 
And there will be some other chairs that will move in. This morning, with an exception of about 15 to 12 to 15 people, in the last two services, we've had our whole congregation even have one tonight. Praise the Lord, good to see her. Had one this morning, couple this morning. And it's good that they're coming home. And I, I praise the Lord for that. But we want to accommodate them. We want to make a very safe area for them. So help us with that next week, and we would appreciate that. Have your Bibles with you tonight. Go back with me to the book of James. James chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. I'm going to be looking at the first five verses tonight. James is the type of book that is just kind of... Can I just kind of say some things tonight that I thought about? First of all, we sing some really good songs about Jesus, but we really don't live it. And thank you for the songs tonight. I love them. Don't get me wrong, but we talk about how we want God's presence, how close we want to get to God, but we only give God about 45 minutes a week. And, and so when you start looking at what we're singing compared to what we're doing, it's like looking in a mirror. Oh, here comes James. And, he, and he's heard the word, but he has not applied the word. So we need to apply to our life what we believe. We have an hour that we live in that people are looking at you and I and going, how are you dealing with the things going on? And you look at them and say one word, Jesus. Jesus. And James is the half-brother of Jesus. James had, there's a lot of things about James that I could share with you that are interesting. Uh, we find some tidbits, we find more of it outside the Word of God. And one of the things that I found very interesting as I was reading it, James prayed so much that he had camel knees. His knees were so worn and calloused that he had prayed so much that he had just worn knees and they actually called him that they said James one the one with the camel knees because his he had been praying so much and you have to understand their their prayer life Jewish prayer life was amazing but then when you added Christ to it it just took it to another level so James writes this and it's almost and he's writing it to the Jewish congregation that is scattered. We find that in verse 1. So let me read the first eight verses again tonight. And again, we're just going to study the top part of it. James, a servant of God, of the Lord Jesus Christ to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire and in wanting nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God and giveth to all men liberally, unbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith. So if we ask of wisdom, we have to ask in faith is what he's saying. Not wavering. So if we're not going to doubt it, we, again this morning we looked at this. He that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven from the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall be received anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Now let's start back at the top, verse 1. James had a right to say some of the things that he says. But he says it because he is looking at everything that has happened to his life, everything that has happened to the life of Christ. Christ lived. Here's the thing about it. James lived with Jesus. James denied he was the Messiah. James even said, He's a little crazy. James was the one that wanted to get him to go back home. But James also was the one that after, at the crucifixion and at the resurrection, realized he was the anointed one. 
James had seen the whole picture. James knew what it was to watch his mother suffer, Mary. He knew what it was to go through all those things and turn defeat, according to Pontius Pilate, according to the Rome, according to everybody else, to turn defeat into one of the greatest victories that we still celebrate today, and that's the resurrection of our Savior. So James has a right to write these things. James is looking at it, and he says it from a perspective that he is looking, and he stops, and he writes it on a piece of parchment paper. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Amplified Bible puts it like this. Consider it wholly joyful, my brethren, whenever you're enveloped or encounter trials of any sort of falling to various temptations. Now, I'll just go ahead and tell you, that does not sound like Western Christianity to me. It doesn't fit us. That does not feel like us. Can I tell you what Western Christianity would say? My brethren, run. My brethren, weep. My brethren, pray harder. My brethren, there must be sin in your life and not sin in my life. And I count it all joy that I don't have problems and you've got them all. That's how we respond. Matter of fact, brothers and sisters, I'll go ahead and tell you that anytime sickness comes upon any of us, we automatically start asking God for a way out. We start asking God, we, we go from asking God to a way out to God, what did I do wrong? God, what, what happened in my life to cause this to happen? What things happened? What, you know, we, we forget that it happens to the just and the unjust. We forget those things, but it sounds just like us. But mature people, mature Christians, they look at it and they say, you know what, I'm going to flex the muscles of faith and I'm going to keep on going. Matter of fact, I remember so well telling my wife something very simple, but when I said it, it was so profound. I remember when I was so sick one time and the original diagnosis, I looked at my wife and I made this very simple statement. Honey, I have preached faith my whole life. Now I've got to put the shoes on and literally walk it. And that's how we are. It's real easy to talk about it until it's us. And then we have to put those shoes on. We have to walk through that valley. We have to walk through that dark time. We have to walk through that sickness. We have to walk through that financial bankruptcy. We have to walk through those family problems. Then all at once, the issue of faith is questioned. We start wavering. We start doubting. We start looking all around. And maybe God is looking at you and I tonight and saying, Buck up. Face it like a child of the king, and walk through it. Matter of fact, that's just life. Sometimes we just have to deal with things that we, we, just, we just have to move on. So let's look at a few scriptures to see this. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 7 through 9. The only way to walk in a mature way is to walk by faith and not by sight and not by emotions. You understand that. We're sight-oriented people. We're sight-oriented. Peter was sight-oriented on Jesus, but the moment he looked down, he started sinking when he stepped out of the boat and was walking on the water. He stepped out in faith and he looked on the author and the finisher of his faith, and the moment he looked down, he started sinking. Very simple illustration. We understand that. But let's look at the scriptures. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 7 through 9. Who in the days of his flesh, now we're talking about Jesus, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared. How many of you remember that Jesus cried, Father, if at thy will, let this cup pass from me. Though he were the Son... Look what happened next. Yet learned he obedience by the things which what happened? He had to go through. Which the things that he 
suffered. Can I go ahead and tell you? He prayed, God, if it possible, let it pass. Not my will, but thy will be done. But by obedience, he had to go ahead and suffer. Jesus had to go through this. The Bible says, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made are not perfect. Now we know Jesus is perfect, but perfecting his faith or improving upon his faith would be the way for you and I to look at it. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Now we realize that Jesus was sinless. We realize that he was perfect. But this is a perfect man, a sinless man that says, Father, if it possible, let this cup pass from me. But if not, Thy will be done. And out of that obedience and out of that submission to what he had to go through, aren't you glad tonight that you and I are sitting here and we're saved or redeemed by the blood of the Lamb? Yes, he was the Son of God. Yes, he was the Son of Man. But there still was a physical level of obedience that he had to go through. Look with me if you would. And I'm going to give you a lot of scriptures tonight. I, I heard this analogy the other day, and I love it. I was sitting listening to somebody, and I told my wife, I said, man, and I, it was Tyler, one of the sermons, and I said, he's using so many scriptures. And then I was listening Wednesday night to Brother Britt, and he was using so many scriptures. And she said, yeah, you do too. And then it dawned on me, have you ever kinked a water hose and put it in your mouth and then unkinked it? Come on now. Yes, you have. Yes, you have. You're outside. You kink that water hose. You're going to get a sip of water. Somebody's kinked it down, and then they let go of it, and it just gushes everywhere. Aren't you glad that God's Word does that sometimes? When you're reading it, it just feels like it just overflows you. And when you start finding scriptures, you find more scriptures and more scriptures. All it does is confirm what you're saying. And then you don't have to remember what I said, but the Word of God does not come back void. And I'm glad of that. So, let's go to the Old Testament. And I want to show you something. Hosea, chapter 7, verse 11. I'll give you a moment to find it. Because I want you to see the nation of Israel. This is in a nutshell of how they would run. And they, when they had problems, they'd do the same thing that we do. They, they would fear or flight. And the moment they decided to quit doing that and start walking for the Lord, God started blessing them. But every time they had fear of flight, they had to fight another battle. They had to fight another battle. They had to fight another battle. They had to get back together and they had to fight another battle. And it was contagious. But Hosea chapter 7 verse 11 through 13, I love this. Sometimes when you read something you go, oh yeah, that's me. And here it is. Ephraim also is like a silly dove. You ever tried to catch a dove? There ain't no way. We got birds in our backyard, and I'd walk up on a lot of the birds, a lot of the other ones, but you get close to a dove, and they're gone. Ephraim also is like a silly dove without harp. They call to Egypt, they go to Israel. And when they shall go, I will spread my net upon them. I will bring them down as the fowls of the heaven. I will chastise them as their congregation hath heard. Woe unto them, for they have fled from me. Destruction unto them, because they have transgressed against me. Though I have redeemed them, yet they have spoken lies against me. Now, I don't know about you, but that just fits me perfect. When trouble comes, it's fear or flight. When trouble comes, I run back to Egypt. I run to my enemies. And the last place I run to is God. You say, you don't run to your enemies. Yes, we do. We run to CNN. We run to Fox News. We run to the things of the world. We... Some of you looked at me like, you got to be kidding, you run to your enemies. Let me ask you this question. Last time you was diagnosed, what was the first thing you'd do? Did you go to the Bible or did you go Google? You understand? We Google it. Well, I got diagnosed. 
I ran to my enemy to find, to see what my enemy said. And my enemy says, you're dying. And then I run to the Bible and the Bible says that you may have life and have it more abundantly. So I lay the Bible back down and I go back to my enemy. I got 30 days to live. You understand? This is what the nation of Israel did. They said they ran back, wanted to go back to Egypt. They wanted to go back to the enemies. And he says, why didn't they come to me? And I threw a net out and captured them. Or let me put it in a way you can understand it. I created a way that they had nowhere to go but come back to me. Every way they went, I put a stumbling block there and God has put roadblocks up for you and I so many different times trying to get our attention that we'll come back to Him. I'm so glad that God put roadblocks up for me. I'm so glad that the Holy Spirit worked on me and kept working on me and finally got to that place where I went to Him and moved in the direction and He kept wooing me back. So the Bible says, Ephraim also is like a silly dove without heart. They call to Egypt, they go to that flesh place, that flesh pot, they go to Ezra, they go the first, they even go into the enemy's camp, when they shall go, I will spread my net upon them, I will bring them down as the fowls of the heaven, I will chastise them as their congregation hath heard, woe unto them for they have fled from who? From God. They have fled from me, destruction unto them, because they have transgressed against me. Though I have redeemed them, yet they have spoken lies against me. They were double standard, double hearted, or as we look at it in this text, double minded. I said it to you this morning. They got to a certain point where they literally says, take us back to Egypt. It was better when we were under bondage. Brothers and sisters, when faith is taken out of the equation, when we take our faith walk and we set it out of the equation and we try to deal with it without faith and we try to figure it out, it's like we go back to the enemy, we go back to the enemy's camp and we do things that are not pleasing. We start flying or moving in the wrong direction. Then we turn one, then we turn to the other. And before you know it, our problem gets bigger. We can't solve it. And it just seems like the problem gets so big, hold on, that we let the problem get bigger than God. And that is a very dangerous place to be. Don't tell me how big your problems are. Tell me how big your God is. We we have a mindset Well, nobody's going through what I'm going through. Well, America's going through something right now that nobody's going through. You need to ask John and Dee Dee how much fun they had for three months in a 900 square foot apartment. You could get out and go in the backyard. You could go fishing. You could go golf. You could cut your grass. You need to ask my my daughter and my son-in-law how it feels just to go for one hour a week to get groceries well nobody's got problems like I do you need to ask Doug and Ramona how it feels to be in another country that not, not even supposed to be there and can't get out so you got to understand when we start looking at problems we create our problems bigger than anybody else's only America has the worst problems only in America our problems are supersized. We don't want regular problems. We want them supersized. And we look at this, and what happens is our outlook then determines our outcome. And you say, what are you saying? I'm just saying to you that our problems get so big, our God gets so small. And before you know it, we fall into temptation, into temptation, into temptation, and we keep moving in the wrong direction. Go and look with me in the book of John chapter 16 verse 33 and I want to share something that Jesus said that's probably going to shock some of you. John 16 33. We've already shared it before but I want you to hear it again tonight. John 16 33. These things I have spoken unto you that you might have peace. In this world you will not have any problems. You are saved. You are a Christian, 
and everything's rosy. Once you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you're not going to have any problems. You're going to be immune to problems. No. In the world, you shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I overcame it. You will have problems. You will have trials. You will have tribulations. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Now who is the author of the world right now? Satan. I want you to understand that he is the prince and the power of the air right now. And Jesus looks at you and I and says, you're going to have problems. Satan is out to steal, kill, and destroy. But I promise you that if you'll follow me, you'll have life and you'll have it more abundantly. John 10, 10. Real simple. Sometimes we look at things, and when we look at the book of James, we have to remind ourselves that James is basically looking at you and I and saying, get over it, get up, and go on. I mean, that's basically what he says to us. He basically says to every one of us, get over it, get up, and go on. Look what he says in Acts 14.22, which is confirming some things that we see. Acts 14.22, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith that we must through much tribulation, oh, uh-uh. I need, a new, I need a new interpretation of this scripture. Through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. We've had it so good for so long that we don't know what it is to have a bad time. Did anybody in this room have to walk five miles to come to church today? Did anybody have to skip a meal and choose to either eat a meal or walk five miles to come to church today. Do you know in third world countries they'll choose not to eat to go serve God? Confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. We are God's scattered people. We've been grafted into the vine. We're not his sheltered people. Do you hear me? We are his scattered people that have been grafted into the vine, and I thank God for that, but we are not his sheltered people. Matter of fact, we're not his favorite. Why do you think we pray for Jerusalem all the time? You understand we're blessed because of that. But the Bible says we will experience trials and tribulations. We cannot always expect everything to go right every day. And we have a very bad understanding of Christianity. And I'm going to be very transparent with you. We look at people that are not having problems and we automatically think that their spiritual life is better than ours. That's wrong. Can I shock you and turn that upside down? Maybe your faith is stronger than theirs because you're handling a lot more than they have and you haven't walked away from God. Uh-oh. That's a wake-up call. See, it's all in how you look at it. Maybe your faith is a little stronger because you're handling those things and you're not walking away from God. And on the other hand, if they were going through the same things, could they handle it? Now that's between them and God. But I'm just telling you, we, we have the wrong concept that if we look at somebody and they're not going through anything and they're, they, matter of fact, can I shock you? This is not a room full of perfect people. Okay, this is a reality. This is reality of the book of James. We're not a perfect people. We don't have a perfect home. We don't have perfect marriages. And we don't have perfect children or grandchildren in spite of what we think. We have problems. And if I were to ask you tonight, every one of you would stand up and say, I have a problem, I have a problem, I have a problem, I have a problem. And most of you would be sitting there going, I didn't know that. I didn't know you were dealing with that. I didn't know that was going on in your life. I didn't know that that was a problem in your physical body. And what, what, but how we perceive is we look at them on the outside and go, man, everything's great. 
And so when we come down to the altar to pray, we pray this very simple prayer. God, I want my relationship like pastors. He don't have problems. I, I don't want, I want like this person, that person. They don't have problems. And that person sitting on the back row, when you go down front, go, God, if I only had her problems, I'd be so much better off. But there's a mindset. And this is what James does throughout the whole gospel. If you go back and read it, he just kind of punches you in the face in very short little moments and says, get over it, get over it, get over it, get over it. This is reality. You've got to walk in joy. You may be scattered. You may be persecuted. You may be the 12 tribes of Israel. You may have scattered after Stephen was stoned. But get over it. There's a, there's a, there's a plan. There's a purpose. God's going to take care of you. And he says the same thing to us. Some trials simply come because we're human. Matter of fact, my dad used to say it like that. Son, that's just life. Some trials come because we bring them on full blown. And we cannot blame anybody but me. Then some trials happen, and like we're dealing with now, it happens with everybody, and it's no respecter of persons nowhere. Nowhere. Here's what I love, and I'll say this and kind of move on. I'm not going to get sick because I do this, I do that, I do that. That don't pl fly. I love what I was told right before church. When it's your time to go, it's your time to go. I, I know of a pastor today that last night went to bed expecting to preach this morning and about two hours later he was in the presence of the Lord. He did not have any sickness. He did not have any side effects. Nothing going on in his life. And if I were to name his name, you'd say, oh, I've heard that name. Nothing happened in his life. He laid down. He kissed his kids goodnight. He laid in the bed. And guess what happened? His heart quit. When it was his time to go, it was his time to go. you got to understand, there are things in life that are going to happen. And you say, well, pastor, what was, I mean, our mindset immediately goes, well, what, what's, what's the reason? Can't we just give it to God? Can't we sometimes just let God have it? And trust God and not let our faith waver, not doubt, not fear, not have doubting minds, double-minded about stuff. Can't we just say, God, you're in complete control. You're sovereign. You're just. You're merciful. 1 Peter 4, 12, and 13. How many of you have ever said that what's going on in your life right now is really strange? Good. You join a good crowd. 1 Peter 4, 12 and 13. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you. As though some strange thing that happened unto you. There is nothing new under the sun. It has happened to somebody else before. But when it happens to us, it's never happened to anybody else. But rejoice in so much as you're partakers of Christ's sufferings that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. Did you hear what he just said? But re some strange thing is happening. There's a fiery trial. And then all at once he says, but rejoice in so much as you're partakers of Christ's sufferings that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. Satan fights against me. The world fights against me. The world, I am, I, battles of life are going to come. Go back to the book of James, chapter 1. James chapter 1, verse 2. And when I was reading this Thursday, I think, yeah, thir Thursday, yeah. When I was reading this Thursday, by the way, free, this is free. My son was at Duke University. Many of you may not know it. 
He is now at Baylor University in Waco, Texas. He is there going for his doctorate degree. And when I mentioned it this morning, some people looked at me and get, I thought he was, and yeah, yeah, he was, but that's where he's at now. So that when I mentioned that, I wanted to clear that up. They have moved back to Waco. But anyway, James chapter 1, verse 2. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall in diverse temptations. Amplified version of that. Consider it wholly joyful, my brethren, whenever you're enveloped in or encounter trials of any sort or fall into various temptations. What do I do, God? Where do I go? How do I get out of this? What can I do? God says, no, wait a minute. Count it all. Count it all. Now, I'm going to share something with you that, how many of you don't like the new math? Okay, I don't like the new math. And I had just figured out the old math, and then it dawned on me that there was another math. When I add columns and numbers, I draw a line at the bottom. Okay? When Greeks added numbers, they draw a line at the top. And I thought, I've never seen that. And yes, I did. My grandmother, when she added columns up, she'd draw a line at the top, and she would add up and put the extra number down and carry it over. Now, you really want to mess up a teacher, do that. But that's what they're saying. They're saying, add it up. Count it up. Count it up. All joy. Literally means sit down and take inventory of how good God has been to you. Whatever you're in right now, whatever's going on right now, sit down and take inventory of how good God's been to you. We're, we're in a crazy time right now. Okay, I, I'll admit that. We're all in a crazy time right now in, in, in just an era of life that someday we're going to look back and go, wow, that was really interesting. And we're going to tell our grandchildren about it and they're going to go, what? You did what? You had what? But what's happening is rather than counting the joyful side of it, guess what numbers we're counting? The negative side of it. How many people got it? How many people died? And we get so fixed on that number. How many people's got it? How many people died? Wait a minute. There's about 11,000 people in this county? And we're only worried about a couple hundred? But our mind is so fixed on that number that we can't even look up. We can't even look in the other direction and count it all joy of how good God is. Now that's not only us, that's our whole world. And I love the charts that they're trying to come up with how it's going to be next month and next year. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, my God's bigger than that. It's real. Life is real. Tribulations are real. Accidents are real. Somebody tonight may be pulling out of the drive and somebody's going to bump you. I hope nothing further than that. Life happens. We count it all joy. We move in the direction of knowing how good God is. So we add it up. We add the numbers up. And as we look at this, we say, God, you're just doing so many good things. James looks at this and he says, move in the positive direction. And then he's going to give us some analogies of it. And I want to show these to you real quick because we find this, that Jesus said this in the book of Matthew and also in the book of Luke. Matthew 5, 10 and 11. Matthew 5, 10, and, 10 through 12. Listen to what he says. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. For theirs, counted up, is the kingdom of what? Heaven. When you and I are being persecuted, or anybody is being persecuted, we always look this way. Or we always look down. 
He literally is saying to them, when everybody is persecuted, when persecution is going on, count it all joy. Look up. Look a little further. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sakes, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men shall revile you, persecute you, shall all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is what? Your reward in heaven. We're more worried about the temporary, the temporal, where we're at right now than what's past this. Francis Chan probably had the best illustration of this that I have ever seen, and I should have done it tonight. He had a long rope that he brought into a sanctuary, and he brought one little piece of it up to the altar, and the rest of it, he taped that one little piece, and the rest of the rope just went all around the sanctuary. And he said, this is your life. This is the vapor. The rest of this is eternity. And it's true. We get so caught up in the moment that we forget what's beyond it. We have to count it up. We have to look up. We have to have the blessed hope. We have to have the peace that passes all understanding. So he says, Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Now guess where the prophets are at? They're in heaven. Luke 6, 22, 23. Luke 6, 23. Blessed are ye when men shall hate you. Oh, that one, don't, we don't like that one. Blessed are ye when men shall hate you, and when they shall separate you from their, their company, and shall reproach you, and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. He says, you're blessed when people separate from you, they don't want to be around you, and if you'll count it up, they're not doing it because of you, but they're doing it for my name's sake. They're doing it because you're following me. Rejoice ye in that day and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is greater were in heaven. For in the like manner did their fathers unto the prophets. Do you realize that they stoned the prophets? Do you realize that they ran Jesus out of the town? Do you realize that they spit upon him? They plucked his beard. They mocked him. They nailed him to an old-fashioned cross. They, they, they whipped him. And, he, and Jesus looks at all of this and he says, you're going to go through tribulations, you're going to go through trials, you're going to go through life, but just count it all up because where you're at now is temporary compared to where you're going. So when you go through tribulations, don't lose your joy. Don't let the temporary moment that you're in cause you to lose your eternal joy. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Think about that a moment. The joy of knowing Jesus Christ as my personal Savior is my strength. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. You've got to understand greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall and do temptations and diverse things and count it up rather than looking at it and saying how bad it is look at it and say how temporary it is how temporal it is when he talks about diverse he's talking about there's going to be various things that are going to happen it's amazing to me that in my life and I'll just use my life for a moment there has been so many different things that happened in my life that I go back and look at and I have some things that are really high on the mark that really was tough to go through. I have some things that I kind of breezed through, some things that were more trouble than others. And when I look at it, I don't see, matter of fact, a lot of it is a blur. But Jesus sees it as a, as a tapestry. He sees it as a woven life that is a testimony to somebody else. Now you think about that a moment. We're living in, in an hour right now where people are losing their joy, they're losing their peace, they're losing their walk with God, they're losing the relationship with the Lord, and the only person they see, the only people they see is the church. 
you and I and brothers and sisters, we're right in the same gutter with them, complaining about the same things, and we ought to be counting it all joy of what we're going through, and we ought to be seeing it as prophecy being fulfilled. We ought to be seeing it as last days, last days that God is showing us, and we ought to be just counting it all joy that our Redeemer is coming. That eastern sky is about to split. We're about to, we're about to go home to glory. Oh, I don't know if I can handle another day. I don't know if I'll make it till Wednesday night, Pastor. I, it's just been, you just don't know how bad it is. When we hear that, and you say that, you're counting it in the wrong direction. I love this one. Well, I hadn't been able to get out and do anything for four months. My mother said that to me the other day. I said, Mom, how old are you? And she said, mm -hmm. she's way up there. And I said, so you're telling me for the last four months you haven't been able to do a whole much. How much have you done prior to that? You, you understand? We're more worried about what's happening right now than how good God's been to us and how good God's going to be to us we're so caught up in the moment and we're so double-minded and we're so double-mouthed and we're so double-souled about this and God is looking at you and I and going, wait a minute, I have blessed you. But I love this. We're like a dove that gets scared and we start looking at all the other answers except for God. God says, wait a minute, I've been here all alone. First Peter 1, 6 through 9. We've used this scripture a few different times in the last couple of weeks. So I want to just kind of read the, the part of it and just move on. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6. Let me just read verse 6. And you go back and read the rest of it. When you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, a season. Oh, by the way, Solomon said there were seasons in life. Time to plant, time to pluck, time to harvest, time to cry, time to laugh. There are seasons. Oh, oh, God put seasons in us. He put harvest seasons. He put the moon. He put the sun. There are seasons. This is a season in life. This too shall pass. This too shall pass. But brothers and sisters, don't get so caught up in it that you don't realize how good God's been. Where now also you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you're in heaven is through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold, that perish, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory under the appearing of Jesus Christ. When we talk about temptations and we talk about trials, we have to go back. And I want you to go back to the book of James, chapter 1. And I want to share some things as I close. There's something I really want to get to tonight for you to see this. James chapter 1. In verse 3, the first part of it, he talks about trials that purify the faith. The latter part of verse 3 talks about that produce patience. Then he talks about in verse 4 where it brings maturity. It's a process. You ever notice... That when you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, so many people think, man, I've made it. You've just begun. It is a new life in Christ Jesus. You are a new creation in Christ Jesus. That's why they call it the new birth. You learn to take the word by the milk then you learn to take the word by the meat. Then you learn that from faith grows another level. And then it grows another level. And then it continues to grow. But so many times, so many of us just stay right there. And God is looking at you and I and saying, No, if you are feeding on the meat of the word, if you're growing in the grace and knowledge and understanding who God is, you will understand that what's taking place is just a momentary bump, a season in life that will move on. But we find this. Go to the book of Romans, 
chapter 5, verse 3 through 5, and let me give you another analogy of it. Romans 5, 3 through 5. And not so, not only so, but we glory in tribulations also. Oh. Knowing that tribulation worketh or bringeth patience. Patience will then bring experience. You ever noticed in a, in a spiritual setting, you have this one person that life is so hard and they can't get over it and they just can't move to the next level. And then you have that other person that looks at them and goes, you know what, I've been through something similar to that, but God never failed me. And let me tell you where God's got me at now. It brings us to the next spiritual level. And patience brings experience. And then experience, guess what it does? It brings hope. i got to ask you just a very simple, simple question. How many of you have ever been through a whole lot of hard stuff physically in your life? Well, guess what? You're going through something now. But God did not fail you then. He will not fail you now. And you have to get back to that place where you know you experienced that with God. God brought you through that. He may have brought you through that car wreck. He may have brought you that, through that surgery. He may have brought you through that crisis in life. And I want you to understand tonight, because of that experience, we now have hope that He will bring us through the next level. He will move us spiritually. The Bible says... And hope maketh not a shame because the love of God is then shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. Guess what happens? When you have peace and hope and you have the peace that passes all understanding and you understand the blessed hope and you're in a conversation with somebody and they're starting to add the numbers and they're going down and they're talking about how many people are sick, how many people are dying and what all is taking place, you look at them and go, my God's greater than that. I mean, you just look at it from a totally different perspective and you look at them and go, but let me tell you how many's got over it. Let me tell you how many's been blessed. Let me tell you how many families have been redeemed. How many families have been saved. How many marriages have been restored. How many people that were in bankruptcy come out of it. We have to look at it from a place of hope. Understand this. There is nothing that can conquer Jesus Christ. He conquered death, hell, and the grave. Death, hell, and the grave. He conquered it. Death cannot exist in front of him. He speaks life over it. But we're not speaking life in a situation right now. We're not. The final product is a beautiful, beautiful thing of the Lord understanding who we are. Let me share two. Two, three more scriptures and I'll stop. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. I want you, before you look at Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, I just want you to look around in the room. Just look around. You, James, so good to see you. Jeanette, so good. I mean, just so Michelle, I mean, man, there's, there are victories. Gail, Jack, Elizabeth, there are victories all in this room. Now, I want you to look at the scripture. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. Now I want you to understand that in heaven there have been prophets, priests, and kings and there have been individuals that walked through faith and have dealt with it. We have family members. We have all kinds. And I, I'm, not, I'm, I'm trying to personalize this just a moment. Hear me out. Wherefore, seeing we're also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Witnesses in heaven. Witnesses in our families, our grandparents, our ancestors, and we have witnesses here around us that have gone through things, and I'm making it very simple for you and I. We're foreseeing we're also compassed about so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. If Jesus made it, I can make it. If Peter made it, I can make it. If John the Baptist made it, I can make it. If Luke made it, I can make it. 
Can I just personalize it? If my grandma made it, my grandpa made it, I can make it. If my great-grandpa made it, I can make it. If that great author that I've read that talked about faith and lived it out can make it, I can make it. There are witnesses that are cheering us on and saying, we went through worst. More troubles and trials and tribulations, but we counted it up rather than counting the cost. We talked about how good God is. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Mm. One last thing that I want to share with you. And while you're turning back to James chapter 1 verse 5, let me remind you of something that Job said. Job said in Job 23.10, But he knoweth the way that I take, and when he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. He knows exactly where you're at tonight in whatever situation you're in. He knows exactly what you're going through, Melissa. James 1.5. I'll close with this very quickly, but I do want to cover this. If or the Greek word that actually ought to be sitting there, since any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and unbraideth not, and it shall be given him. God's wisdom is available for you and I. Now let me make some very simple analogies here, not use the scriptures if you'll give me permission. When they went to build the tabernacle in the wilderness... God gave men wisdom to build it, to fit together. That wisdom was from the Holy Spirit. I want you to understand that. When God gave Noah the plans to build the ark for the saving of, of humanity at that time, that wisdom was imparted on him from the Holy Spirit. Throughout the Gospels, and I can take you by scriptures in many different places, even in the building of the temple, even in building the furnishings, when, when men were separated and God gave them very specific instructions, and when they all come together, it fit perfect. That cannot be anything but the Holy Spirit. That is the wisdom that the Holy Spirit wants to give. James says... In James chapter 1 verse 5, since any of you lack wisdom, can I just go ahead and tell you, I need a lot of spiritual wisdom. I don't know how many times I have prayed this prayer, and I remember very specifically praying, and I have been with individuals, and we were in the hospitals with doctors, and we, we have individuals going on. And I would pray, God, lay it on that doctor's heart. Lay it on that nurse's heart to go back and double check that or to rethink that or for their mind to be clear and give them wisdom that can only come from you. I don't know about you, but there have been many times in my life that I have needed wisdom for a very quick moment. Matter of fact, Jesus told the disciples, don't worry about what you've got to say. When you need to say it, I will teach you and I will speak on your behalf and I'll speak with wisdom and authority. What are you saying, Pastor? I want you to look at this. I want you to understand, if you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally. How many of you realize that Jesus has the Holy Spirit and it's a gift that he wants to give every one of us? He wants to give this to us. It's not something that he is bribing us and he gives us to an overflow. You and I need to be operating and moving in the Spirit and we need to be asking God to give us direction. In Matthew, God gave good things. In Luke, God gives the Holy Spirit. And in James, God says, James says, God gives wisdom. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 
verse 7 through 11. For the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit who? With all. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of, guess what? Wisdom. When was the last time, now I'm talking about being double-minded, I'm talking about all the chaos that's going on, I'm talking about how we're counting it down rather than counting it up. I'm talking about all the trials and tribulations and we're in the middle of all this. When was the last time you just stopped and you said, Holy Spirit, I cannot do this without you. I cannot walk out of my house today without you guiding and directing me. Holy Spirit, I cannot deal with a crisis going on in my family without you. When was the last time? See, we're double-minded. We're too sold and we're trying to figure it out over here and we fly like a dove and we run and the enemy jumps on us and, and I love how God does. God just keeps bringing us back and we keep quenching the spirit and he keeps bringing us back and we quit keep quenching the spirit he keeps bringing us back because he loves us and he says if you'll ask of me wisdom I'll give it to you I won't hold any back and I got to ask you as we close when was the last time that you asked the Holy Spirit to give you direction in what you're facing today Let me give you a simple analogy. I don't know if we need plexiglass. I don't know if we need PPEs. I don't know if we need money. I don't know if we're going to get grants. I don't know if we're going to get loans. I don't know if I got the shots. I don't know if I got the pills. I don't know if I got this. When was the last time? I don't know if I've talked to the Holy Spirit first. You understand? That's why we're so double-minded. We're feeding the flesh side. And we're quenching the spirit side. And we're wondering why we're not stable and don't have peace. And we're listening to every voice but the voice that is trying to speak to us. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the spirit is saying to the church. To his people. To you and I. Let me read it as I close. James 1, 1 through 8. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. To the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad. Greetings. Joyful. My brethren... Count it all joy when you fall in diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. Let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire and wanting nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and unbraideth not. Now let me stop right there. I said it to you this morning and I'll say it to you tonight. The 12 tribes separated after the martyrdom of Stephen. They were there on the day of Pentecost. They were empowered with the Holy Spirit. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and unbraideth not, and it shall be given to you. Or when you ask for a refilling, a refreshing, let him ask... In faith, not wavering. Don't doubt it. You were there. You experienced it. You saw it. You were there and you saw the upper room. You saw the 3,000 filled with the baptism of the Holy Spirit and you're part of them. For he that wavereth is like a wave of sea driven from the wind and tossed. 
Let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Can I tell you why we're so confused and why we're so unstable? Is the church has quenched the move of the Spirit. And I said it in the opening and I say it closing. We know how to sing the songs but we don't know how to live them right now. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Heavenly Father, stir us deeply as you have stirred me. Mm. I have quenched the moving of the Holy Spirit. I have not asked for guidance and direction and comfort of the Holy Spirit. You told me that you would not leave us comfortless. You would not leave us as an orphan child out lost, but that's exactly how we feel right now. We feel totally out of pocket, out of place, out of sort, out of step. But you were here. Holy Spirit, move and minister. Mm. Heads bowed and eyes closed right where you're sitting. And I got to ask you a very simple question. Did you give it to the Holy Spirit to begin with? Or did you get so double-minded, so caught up in trying to figure it out, trying to put the puzzle together, seeing the trials and tribulations and it all going in all different directions? But when was the last time that you welcomed the Holy Spirit? Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this place. You are welcome to Tabernacle right here, right now. Heads bowed and eyes closed. We, we admit to you that we have quenched your spirit mm. oh we've been tossed around we've been so unstable in our ways so double minded so double souled in this time oh Holy Spirit comfort your church tonight Hallelujah, hallelujah. So yes. To trust yes, Jesus. Jesus. Would you stand? Just you may feel like you lift a hand, lift a voice. You may feel comfortable coming, standing around this front a little bit or kneeling. But would you give the Lord a moment? Hallelujah, Jesus. Oh, we worship you tonight, Lord. Jesus, Jesus, how I Oh, we sing it. Do we believe it? May we believe what we sing tonight, Lord. about what you just said. Oh, how sweet hallelujah, hallelujah. Jesus, oh, we worship
that there will be a restoration there will be a healing there will be a deliverance there will be people coming home we're going to pray for revival and here's what we're going to pray that the gates of hell are not going to prevail against it and it's going to be empowered by the Holy Spirit and I'm telling you brothers and sisters and, and I say this with love there are a lot of churches in America tonight that are having to fight to stay open you're going to read about it. We're not having a fight to stay open. But we need revival in our county. God's planted us here for such a time as this. Father, I pray for every pastor, every church in this county. God, I pray that they prosper, that they're blessed, that there is a health that would come up on their body of believers. God, that you would bring revival in the pew. You would take revival to the pulpit all throughout this county, God. God, there would be a restoring of your church. God, that there would be a revival in this county. Lord, that you would do a work. Father, it has to be led by the Holy Spirit. And Lord, I pray that you would inspire, you would direct, you would guide. Lord, that you would not leave them as they think the things have left them, but you would move them to a greater place than they've ever been before. Lord, we're counting down rather than counting up. We need to look at the spiritual things rather than the numerical things. We need to see what you're doing in the spiritual realms. Lord, may we look at things from a spiritual perspective. God, I pray for every pastor. God, that you would move upon their hearts and their lives. Move upon us as a church. Bless us as we lift others. Bless our missionaries, God. Move upon their hearts. Give them insight, direction, and guidance. In thy name we pray. Amen and amen. Amen. Turn around, high five three people.